I still remember seeing the avalanche and I was like left of the sky to the right of the sky. The whole sky is filled with this debris of snow and ice. Almost like a massive ice tsunami coming towards us. Uh with like nowhere to run, like no right, no left. Like I still remember seeing that avalanche and like I don't think I'm going to die. I'm like 100% going to die. That's it done. Like you know I'm like finished here. That was Kuntal Joysher and this is my vegan personal trainer podcast with Remy episode number 5. Welcome to the My Vegan Personal Trainer podcast where it's all about living a fit plant-based lifestyle so you can thrive in life while caring for the planet and animals. And now your host medical doctor crossfit athlete and online personal trainer Remy Hey it's Remy and welcome to episode number 5 of the My Vegan Personal Trainer podcast 160 km per hour winds temperatures well below freezing point oxygen levels not supportive of human life and looming avalanches These all sound like good reasons to stay away from such a place. Yet our today's guest is someone who keeps going back for more even though he gets caught in an avalanche, completely certain he's about to die. His passion and obsession for the mountains and his commitment to the vegan movement has led him off the comforts of his 9 to 5 job as a software engineer to summiting the highest place on earth, Mount Everest. Today's interview was conducted last summer of 2021. Subscribe if you're not already a member of the tribe and just a boring disclaimer. The information provided in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not meant to take the place of professional medical, dietetic or fitness advice. Consult with a relevant professional for your specific situation. And now without any further ado, help me welcome the man who stands behind the world's first 100% vegan summit of Mount Everest Kuntal Joysher. All right so uh, Kuntal Joysher welcome on the My Vegan Personal Trainer podcast. Uh, how are you doing? Pretty good pretty good. Thank you so much for the invite and uh, I'm doing as good as I can be uh, mm-hmm. given the current circumstances around the world but uh, not complaining at all and yeah doing pretty good. Yeah. How is the uh, situation with covid currently in your in your uh, region you're in Mumbai currently I am indeed based in Mumbai and uh, I think things are pretty reasonable here in Mumbai probably if you were asking me the same question in March April or May yeah. it was terrible because the the virus was spreading like crazy across the country but mm-hmm. now it's a bit more under the control and things are uh, in reasonable shape uh i'm you know still staying safe uh, if i go out to hike i still go out in smaller groups in groups of people i trust or if i go climbing then i did create a small bubble around my expedition and kind of just you know staying safe staying smart in uh, these circumstances i don't want to add to the problem which is already you know a big problem across the world so doing whatever i can and otherwise if there's uh, like if there's no essential travel i'm at home and yeah okay uh, but before we get into any in the meat of the conversation let's just could you maybe just give a brief intro of um, who is kuntal joysha um and uh, and uh, you're a vegan and just a little mention about like why what's the reason behind you going going vegan right so i am a vegan indeed and i've been a vegan for 19 years uh, and I turned vegan back in December of 2002 and this was primarily uh, for ethical reasons because I connected the dots that there's really no difference between a piece of meat or a glass of milk and a leather belt or for that matter any product that for which an animal uh, is exploited or for any product where an animal is used and uh, been born and brought up in a vegetarian family i always had that mindset of compassion and mindset of kind of you know uh, animals are here sharing the planet with us mm-hmm. and that always treating animals like we would treat human beings so that was always at a mindset level and that was always at an attitude level 
but uh, i still ended up drinking a lot of milk i still ended up wearing a lot of animal products and i still ended up consuming a lot of animal products i just hadn't made the connection yet and so the moment i made the connection and it was pretty obvious to me at that point it was a no brainer the the only way forward was to go vegan because in some sense uh, we as individuals definitely control what food we eat and what we wear on our body and what products we use so that is definite at least in the privileged world and if you are sitting here on a zoom call and talking to each other we we live in a privileged world okay so it, it especially being privileged people i think a lot of these things are choices and we can make these choices and i thought that would be a good starting point to have in terms of my vegan journey of course over a period of many years i made various different connections around climate change around just the health impact of uh, eating plants and those kind of things and uh, the journey has only uh, been great uh, the only regret i have had in the last 19 years is uh, why didn't i go vegan sooner why didn't i make the connection sooner mm-hmm. so that is uh, in terms of uh, my vegan journey but who i am uh, well i am really in some sense just a regular guy the next door you know just leading life like everyone else on this planet is uh, just happened to be someone who fell in love with mountains who went and climbed everest uh, for living i uh, work as a part time software engineer and i am a nutrition coach as well uh and yeah other than that i just spend a lot of time training and climbing mountains and that's pretty much you know what my life looks like so that's who i am right and uh, also just to add to it it was not it's not just once you've been to mount everest you summited it's twice correct me if it's wrong it was in uh, uh, 2016 and then 2019 again that you uh, submitted absolutely yeah. yes yeah. um great and uh, it was not like it was not like first try and then uh, whoopsie and then we were on top of mount everest like you you had some uh, some challenges some failures along the way um and the main focus of today's episode with with interviewing you is basically the journey that took you from around 2010 from my research that's where you discovered okay this is what you want to go for where you were living as a regular guy were having a 9 to 5 job uh, as a um, soft, software engineer and then now I want to go conquer mountains um I want to be climbing them um so could you maybe like take it from the describe that situation like where were you before starting this journey like uh, paint the picture a bit who was called K- K- uh, kuntal joshua before 2010 so uh, i was uh, so i was here based in mumbai uh, going back to my vegan journey i was at that time living in the united states and i was doing my masters degree so i did my masters in the us and i got a job in the us and i was working as a software engineer i kind of you know went up the corporate ladder and uh, i was an engineering manager in the us and then there was this opportunity where i could have moved to mumbai uh, and i wanted to move to mumbai to take care of my parents mm-hmm. and luckily there was this coincidentally this uh, thing happened where my company purchased another company a los angeles based company out of all places in the world purchased a company in mumbai mm-hmm. and they needed someone to go to mumbai and i'm like wow this is like you know it's like just everything f- fell in place and i came to mumbai uh, and um, i started building out the company here uh, and so just you know regular kind of you know as you said 9 to 5 job and uh, it was of course uh, in the world of software and uh, it, while i was living in the us i was very very concerned about my health and i was very very particular about my fitness i used to cycle every day and i used to like pay a lot of attention to a lot of these things and i was about i remember when i moved to india i was about 78 kgs and uh, within few months of living in india i was near about 105 106 kgs i put on a shit ton of weight i was super unhealthy and uh, i didn't care about my fitness i didn't care about what i was eating as long as it was vegan that's all i cared about quick question and how tall are you just to get a, a i am uh, 5'10 
Five ten in centimeters. That's uh, like one hundred and seventy-seven. One seventy-seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please carry on, sir. Yeah. So, uh, I was here in Mumbai. Got married, and life was good. You know, I, I had no complaints. Mm-hmm. I was making a lot of money and uh, enjoying the life. And then, out of the blue, my wife and I decided we wanted to go and you know uh, take this trip to a Himalayan uh, destination because. the sole reason was my wife had never seen snow in her entire life and for me it had almost been what about 20 years or maybe even more than that of seeing snow and when you're living in los angeles when i was living in the us there's no snow in los angeles not in the proper city at least so never saw snow snow in the us and um, so we you know decided we'll go to this himalayan place called shimla in the winters we land there in february of 2009 and uh, for the first 6 days we were like typical tourists living in hotels and complaining about the heater broken and complaining about no water in the toilet and those kind of things which i would never complain about today heck i live in places where there's no water there's no heater there's nothing for weeks and weeks sometimes months uh, but anyway back then we were just regular tourists and uh, we didn't see any snow we were just pissed we were pissed to, you know like to the core <laughs> and uh, in the last day we were like roaming around the market place and uh, we run into this driver who says that i'm going to show you snow i i know the secret place and we were like yours are money like you know take us where, you know where you can sh- show us some snow so this g- driver kind of you know takes us to this place called narkanda which is i'm not going to go into details of it but it's on the it's on the old india tibet highway which is now shut down by the way because there's no access between india and tibet now uh but it is on the old india tibet highway and about 100 kilometers drive and we were like in the village of narkanda it's like a very small village and we were like standing near a tea shop uh and i remember being surrounded 360 degrees by the majestic himalayan mountains and i could see snow everywhere and it was like an amazing moment but i told my driver look you know what we are here to touch snow like don't just show us snow i can you know go to youtube and you know see snow if i wanted to i mean like don't like try and fleece us and stuff he's like i'm not trying to do that i'm going to show you snow i'm going to make you touch snow and there's a small mountain which is drivable from here it's about 8 kilometers and it's called hatu peak it's at about 11500 feet so we're going to drive up that mountain and i know for a fact because i've spoken to locals and they have said that there is a lot of snow on the top so i'm like great let's go so we kind of start the journey and uh, about half a kilometer into the drive we run into almost a feet and half of snow and his he has his really small car that's not going to go on top of snow he didn't even have chains or anything he's like you you don't want to go on the top of the peak you just want to see the snow so just you know like go see the snow enjoy let's get back home now so both me and my wife went into the snow like threw snowballs at each other played snow angels and you know all the cool stuff we enjoyed our time uh, i don't know what happened after that I think if I have to point out one moment that actually did a U turn of my entire life, I think it has to be that very moment. Because I told my wife, we have enjoyed until now. We really love it. Let's just go, you know, further and see what's there. And we just started walking. Like it was completely out of whim because we were like I was wearing a t-shirt and I was wearing a jeans and I was wearing like sandals. That's not a tire that you would go and do a hike in snow. That's like the stupidest idea on the planet <laughs> in some sense. But we decided we'll just walk for fifteen minutes. We'll see what's out there. And so we started walking, and we just started enjoying the walk so much. And we were like, you know what? Let's just continue. And it was an eight-kilometer-long road. Uh, we had no idea about it. We had never hiked in our lives in some sense before. But we continued. for the next 3 3 and a half hours and at the end of that we were standing on the very top of the peak that this guy was talking about and to me it was absolutely mind boggling when i reached the top uh it was so quiet i mean i have been in the united states and united states is freaking quiet you can actually you know hear your food being digested and you were like the first time when i landed in united states i'm like is there a problem with my stomach or something how can i hear growling and all of this stuff happening in my stomach and that was like shock for me uh doesn't happen in india because it's so noisy so noisy all the time that you can barely hear anything you have to literally shout to each other when you are living in your homes as well so 
uh, here we were on top of the peak but it was so quiet this time around i could literally hear as if someone had put a loud speaker on my heart and it was like boop boop i'm looking at my wife and i'm like fuck can she hear me like can she hear my heartbeat and like i'm like no you know this is like what is happening to me and it was so quiet it was like absolutely magical in some sense and i was blown away for the first time in my life i could leave all you know the the kind of you know thoughts that you have constantly in your mind you're always planning for that future that you had never seen you're always pondering over the mistakes in your past but in doing all of that you're kind of you know just forgetting that present is you know getting lost you're not living in that present but there on the top of that mountain i was able to exist in that very microsecond of the moment i felt truly alive i felt this very different deep sense of happiness mm-hmm. and i i was just blown away and that state of mind that i was able to achieve sure you know people who use shit ton of drugs to probably achieve that kind of you know state of mind but to be able to do that without usage of any drugs or usage of anything just standing on top of that mountain i was just blown away i thought if i'm passionate about technology shouldn't i feel the same way about technology when i'm working on technology and i, I nothing happened after that we just you know we came down we were like really happy we went we came back to mumbai and i thought i am going to feel like this when i build out my next company and you know i'm such a passionate technologist unfortunately i never felt that way about technology at all and uh, i thought i'll do do something uh and i said maybe let's go climb a mountain again you know I, why not try it let's see what happens so a couple of months later i signed up for a trip and i go to back to the mountains and i get to the top of a mountain exactly the same feeling i'm like this is amazing and i think that's kind of led me to just climbing doing shorter treks and just doing whatever i could like i had a job so i couldn't really take time off but i could easily do something where i took a flight friday night and went to the himalaya so i live in india so himalaya is fairly accessible to me in, at least in terms of getting a flight and i was willing to spend that money so saturday morning you are literally in middle of the himalaya saturday sunday you hike maybe get back monday to the road head and then a flight back on tuesday morning so at least tuesday to friday you are working a day off no one's really going to you know crib about it every few weeks uh and that was kind of you know working nice and steadily until i decided i wanted to see the tallest mountain in the world everest i mean it's the most iconic mountain on the planet yes there are other mountains that are amazing that are much more difficult that there's far more stuff you know out there that is far more challenging than everest and tougher than everest but everest will always be everest it's the tallest mountain in the world how, how many people do you know you know have climbed the second tallest mountain in the world heck half the people on the planet don't even know which is the second tallest mountain on, yeah, on the planet yeah don't care it's just like what is the tallest and, and that's it <laughs> so yeah. i was in that zone at that point in my life where yeah. i wanted to see everest i wanted to see it up close so i signed up to an everest base camp trek and uh, prepared for about 6 months uh, as much as i could i would not say it would be the best preparation ever but i did what i could uh, landed in kathmandu um uh, and this was october of 2010 and then took a short flight uh, to this place called lukla which is the start of the trek to everest base camp it's also it also houses one of the most dangerous airports in the world i still remember like you know when the flight landed all the passengers in the flight were clapping and i'm like what what why i've i've never been on a flight like this and it's like you know they were thankful that we just landed alive so i'm like wow this is you know all insane what i'm getting into is it like because of the uh, weather conditions uh, due to weather conditions or what is it that it makes it the most dangerous airport the weather conditions the turbulence in the flights the airport itself with you know the runway only being about half a kilometer and it's being surrounded every uh, you know across the board by like you know mountains and then you're like oh. just flying like you literally flying over ridges which are like 50 feet like away from yeah. your plane the plane like what 10 people are sitting in the plane and it's like an insane experience to kind of just go through so 
you land at the airport and then for the next 10 days we walk through some of the most spectacular scenery that i have ever seen in my life some amazing himalayan scenery and um, we reach uh, everest base camp and so in some sense back then it was a huge achievement for me because look i come from a background where no one no one in my ancestry probably if i trace back thousands years of my ancestry i don't think anyone has even climbed one floor forget walking to the everest base camp like people are just unhealthy as fuck in my you know community and my family it's just unparalleled level of unhealthiness that you will you know kind of uh, find in my community so here i am someone walking to everest base camp it was unprecedented in some sense so it was a huge achievement for me but mm-hmm. i think that aside i didn't really care about that uh, what i cared about is that when i landed at everest base camp i couldn't see everest and i was so pissed it was so ironic in some sense it was so anti climatic i'm like man you achieve like the biggest dream you have and then you can't even see the mountain like that's like anyway luckily our team had set up a nice short detour from everest base camp to a place called pumori base camp pumori is also known as the daughter of everest and it's like a massive mountain uh, in, in, in the same area and it offers some unparalleled views of everest and um, so we reached pumori base camp and we were all camped inside i remember just reaching pumori base camp and all, there were clouds all over and so you're like man i come go to that that place and i can't see the mountain now i come here i can't see the mountain and it's like you know what's going on so then we are seated inside the dining tent which is generally where in most expeditions people kind of get together and hang out and eating food and exchanging stories and just enjoying our time a little bit warm inside you know like in a tent and uh, i remember this guy like one of the sherpas shouting my name outside and like if someone shouting our name in a mountain it's almost always never good so i was like what happened like i'm like just shit is my bag not arrived what happened like so you quickly ran out and i am like there's not a cloud in the sky and uh, the sherpa is saying look at everest so i turn around and i look at everest and it's like the sunset happening on everest it's like last rays of sunset directly falling on everest like i remember every other mountain near everest there's lotse and there's noopse and there's lola on this side and there's like massive range with you know tons and tons of mountains nearby but all those mountains were in the color of gray and blue but everest bang in the middle top of the world burning golden in color and i'm like this is amazing like not a cloud in the sky and you see everest this way it was like a dream come true and uh, like you know standing there i thought it would be so cool if i would be standing there right on that point on the top of the world and while it seems absolutely impossible like for someone like me to go on this journey it seems impossible but this seems like such an amazing aspiration and a dream to have and i think that's when i kind of promised myself standing there looking at everest i am going to stand on top of this mountain and i am you know going to get to the top and this is the biggest dream of my life and i do want to kind of take a step back here and point out a specific verbiage that a lot of people used uh, and even uh, you mentioned about that is you know conquering a mountain uh when i stood there and i saw everest uh, probably not knowing anything about mountains or not knowing anything about what i was getting into maybe i thought i am going to conquer the mountain but heck in the hindsight i can tell you one thing no human can ever conquer any mountain on this planet just mountains are not conquerable i think it is while i don't want to animate mountains and give them human nature but it is almost always the mountains that are going to decide whether you are going to make it to the top or not so it's always the end decision is mountains oh, you are going to make it to the top oh, you're not so it's mm-hmm. always the mountain and in some sense i think the conquering mindset does exist still but in my perspective a lot of that conquering mindset exists in terms of conquering my own inner everests you know conquering yeah. all those limitations that you set for yourself i can't do it i can't do it or that fear of failure all the time 
what if i fail what what would happen you know if this happens or that happens or what if i die which is you know very very big reality on everest right so you are kind of having to overcome a lot of those inner you know kind of demons i don't know what's the right word here but to kind of conquer those and to get to a point where you can actually get to the top of the mountain so i think a lot of conquering happens just not of the mountain probably just of the inner mountains that you have that you have to climb uh so yeah i think this is probably october 2010 is where truly speaking i decided that i'm going to climb everest and that this is going to be probably the overarching journey of my life and or probably not entire life but probably significant chunk of my my life for the next few years and that's kind of where it all started okay so 2010 you were seeing uh, the peak mount everest uh, in this golden uh, br- uh, golden color and you getting this feeling okay I, it could be great to get there and i want to get there on top and um, so you're standing there so what's next so now uh, you took the decision so uh, did you uh, sign up with somebody to train with them to get ready for for the expeditions to come or like w- what was the next step from there so i remember the moment i like decided in my mind i want to climb everest mm-hmm. and then i like you know walk back inside the dining tent uh now the right hand side of the dining tent had this massive board which had like pictures of dead climbers which had pictures of climbers with cut fingers and cut toes and cut noses and cut ears and and like you know like gruesome dead bodies and i always you know thought peculiar because i had seen that board even when i was like just entering the camp like i was telling my uh, expedition leader this does not seem like the smartest marketing strategy it's like almost like you are saying you know just don't come on everest like you know just stay at home that would like be the better choice and so i was like discussing with him about climbing everest and all of those things and i like just happened to ask him what in his mind was that secret ingredient behind climbing everest or that you know that that one thing if you would have to tell someone like me who was an everest aspirant from that moment onwards as what would it you know what would put me on top of the world and he said kuntal to climb to the top of the world you need a top of the world body and you need a top of the world mind and you will have to go on a journey to build both of those and so i i i was you know there was like a some sense of a clarity that this is not like i'm just going to you know sign up and come show up next year and climb to the top of this mountain not happening i simply have zero genetic disposition i have zero back background in fitness as zero background in climbing as zero background in heck even in hiking i have i have no background like in some sense odds are stacked against me so i went back home and sometimes the engineer in me kind of just takes over and will start reverse engineering a lot of things and i'm like if i set myself up for maybe 5 years down the line of climbing everest how can i you know reverse back and count till today of what what all steps can i take and i i can share you know three very important things that in the hindsight i feel i did right because a lot of things sometimes you're just doing like there's not a lot of at least in that moment probably as i you know look back i didn't think i was thinking in that structured of a fashion but now in the hindsight i can give a lot of structure to it of what i did right uh and i think the three main pieces were first number one piece is focusing on my physical fitness and ensuring that i had superior cardiovascular endurance compared to what i was at that point almost to the level of that i would be like a superman level cardiovascular endurance that is you know kind of what i focused on quite through you know the last decade long journey uh and at the same time i also understood that cardiovascular endurance yes it can be built as a silo on its own but it needs to be kind of backed by some bit of uh, strength and con- like you know uh, like either muscle strength or muscle endurance or both so both of them kind of you know need to be attached to this and that combination is what is going to give me the fitness that i'm looking for it can't just be cardio 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 it also has to be some form of strength work uh, maybe 
in in my journey i have focused on a lot more body weight strength training rather than going and lifting weights which now in the hindsight i feel was not the smartest choice or smartest decision to make uh but anyway i am just you know going to run through what i did at that point of time uh so that was my number one crucial piece the number two piece was mountaineering something that didn't come naturally to me it's not like i have been mountaineering from seven, the age of 7 or 8 like how most typically good mountaineers or strong mountaineers you will see doing so i didn't have that background so i thought it would be smarter to kind of train do a mountaineering course like a basic version and advanced version course uh, kind of build that skill that is necessary for me to be a reliable and a safe mountaineer on the mountains and like when i am part of a team it shouldn't feel to the team members that this guy is a liability he just doesn't know shit and like it, they shouldn't you know think that way about me they should like kind of feel man this guy is strong if we get into trouble we can depend on him that was kind of my mindset always so i would say a lot of failures in there trying to you know figure out what courses to do what not courses to do so i did few things didn't work out i did few things that worked out but overall i would say building skill is very important either it be through formal courses or it be through climbing mountains and learning while you know you are climbing mountains whatever you can do works even heck seeing youtube videos and practicing in your own apartment complex where there's no snow where there's no you know nothing you can still do a lot of those things but important to build skill uh, so that was like the second big piece and then the third big piece was building solid experience like serious good experience and i'm talking about varied experience in terms of altitude experience let's say climbing 5000 meter mountain 6000 7000 8000 meter not just one two but many 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 of them climbing in ice climbing in snow climbing in rock climbing in all sorts of terrain uh climbing in you know like rain climbing in when it's snowing climbing when it there's a snowstorm going on hey, climbing when it's super dark when you can't even like see anything climbing with maybe one hand tied behind just to kind of simulate if i fell down and broke my hand how would i still end up climbing climbing without food climbing without water whatever i could simulate i'm like mm-hmm. like i'm thinking imagine if i get lost on my summit push like let's say a summit and i'm descending and i get lost for whatever reason shit happens on the mountain you know things go wrong and uh, if i don't have any food or water and if i don't have any oxygen am i going to survive if i can't survive at sea level for 24 hours without you know any of those things how am i going to you know do that on top of the world it's just not happening so i had to simulate a lot of condition conditions here uh, and so that's what i did in kind of my first my run up to my first expedition of climbing everest did a lot of treks here near mumbai the mountains are not very big about the height, the tallest mountain is about 1500 meters which is which is like nothing which is like literally the yeah. height of kathmandu you know like mm-hmm. you fly and you you get to kathmandu and that's the height of you know the highest mountain in mumbai but the mountains are very rugged very steep very technical so there's a lot of skills to be learned uh so did a lot of these three things simultaneously over a period of four four and a half years and i think combination of all of these things potentially also gave me that top of the world mind because there's really no blueprint for how you can you know get mental toughness or mental fitness that's going to be very individualistic for every you know human being like let's say you know you want to like get jacked and become a bodybuilder and stand on stage sure you know you can follow a certain kind of plan certain hypertrophy practices certain you know uh good resistance training practices eat in a certain way do certain things in a certain way and you over a period of time with enough consistency and discipline probably build a you know decent amount of you know muscle uh yes there may be certain things that you may do differently than you know what others are doing uh but there's still a blueprint but when you are talking about hey how do i build mental fitness this there's no one blueprint that is going to you know kind of work for all there's no cookie cutter program here there's no none of this stuff everyone has to find their own way so for me it was like going through three of these things and through a lot of experience in these three of these things of failures of challenges of a lot of adversity 
is where i felt that i built that mental toughness and that mental stamina required to get to the top of the world in some sense it is what i call mental progressive overload you know just to kind of give people an idea of they they always know what progressive overload in resistance training world means but then you know like every expedition you go every expedition you do it's like mental progressive over you are like getting better 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 so that's kind of you know what i did over a period of so many years and finally i was ready to climb everest in for for the first time in 2014 so that's how kind of the training journey looked like I, like i was trying to keep it brief but yeah so you you basically went on uh, focusing on those three points which was uh, getting fitter strong and more endurance so uh, building up a cardiovascular base uh that's one and focusing on uh, the skill of mountaineering based because the skill was not really uh, um had not evolved yet in in you because you had had done done it before and then the third one was the have getting experience actually getting on a mountain uh or many mountains and then being in different scenarios different problems that you need to solve and something that will later on that you will be meeting going uh for everest so you've been doing this for like four years and then uh, you were you felt ready uh, you it's like a feeling and then you were you just went okay now let's go for everest or or there's something uh, were you consulting with someone okay that then said gave, gave you green light okay now you ready or, or how was it then so i think it was multiple things i was part of an expedition in october of 2013 uh which was called the everest boot camp it was a 30 day expedition in the himalaya where we were climbing multiple 6000 meter mountains and um, the expedition leader was the same guy who was also my expedition leader in october of 2010 and uh, i remember summiting the first peak and uh, coming down and he had been seeing my journey since day 1 uh, and then he had also seen me on that expedition as well where uh, how i i was walking every day how i was progressing on the mountain how i was kind of picking up skills and learning and doing things on the mountain and um, when i came back from the summit i probably internally like knew i am like strong like i'm like we were 17 climbers on that team and i knew i am like i don't like generally do this comparison where i'll compare myself to others or any of those things but like back then i like thought maybe if i have to gauge myself and compare myself to the rest of the team I think I'm probably in the top three guys on on the 17 member team, which was a very strong team. People from Australia, people from Norway, people from all across the world, an international experienced, team. Experienced, uh, experienced climbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty amazing team. So, yeah, I like felt like man, I'm ready. I I am okay. ready to climb Everest. Like I feel very strong. And then Tim, uh, I was talking to Tim. You know, like. like about signing about signing up for everest uh, and, and stuff and tim said from what i have seen you in the last three uh, years or so i think you're ready you need to sign up for climbing everest and like both things happening together coincidentally probably look tim was just trying to sell his trip he says you know like hey if this guy comes on my trip you know I, like he makes money but uh, i don't think you know from knowing tim that he is like that so two things happening together me thinking that i'm like really strong and ready to climb everest and then tim coming and telling me the same thing i think that was it that was kind of uh, like i need to go like i need to sign up and uh, luckily at that point uh, my employer of many years of more than a decade or so uh, also kind of were ready to sponsor my climb they said that hey you know what uh, we have also seen your transformation journey and uh, we are really 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 inspired by what you are doing and we would like you to take our flag to the top of mount everest and uh, so like kind of everything fell in place yeah. right you know uh, around that time and yeah i think that's when i was kind of ready to uh, go and like climb everest Yeah, and, and then speaking about uh, you can't conquer the mountain, but the mountain decides whether okay today is Quintal's day or not. It actually fit for 2014 and 15 attempts for climbing Mount Everest. Both of them was were avalanches that uh, disrupted the expedition, or how was it? Correct. So 2014 was an avalanche in the Khumbu Icefall area, which killed 17 Sherpa guides. So that was the end of 2014 expedition, and then. 
2015 expedition was a massive earthquake a 7.9 magnitude earthquake that hit nepal and uh, that induced an avalanche at the everest base camp this time around the avalanche didn't happen higher up on the mountain but actually wiped out the base camp itself and we were stationed at the base camp we were in the middle of the avalanche uh, and um, we mirac- miraculously kind of escaped near death uh, i still remember seeing the avalanche and i was like left of the sky to the right of the sky the whole sky is filled with this debris of snow and ice almost like a massive ice tsunami coming towards us uh with like nowhere to run like no right no left like i still remember seeing that avalanche and like i don't think i'm going to die i'm like 100% going to die that's it done <laughs> like you know i'm like finished here so like you were standing and like and you know in some sense i always thought if ever a situation happened where i was going to die on the mountain and like i'm faced with it i would be like shit scared but again it was such an anti climatic feeling that you like you are faced with a certain death and i'm not scared at all on the contrary i just want to cry and i'm like man i don't want to die like i just don't want to die like it's too soon like there's so much to be achieved in life there's so much to be done in life and now you and and you can't escape this thing so it, it was really like in some sense um, like every single moment i have spent since escaping that avalanche i have considered that as a bonus because in some sense i had written off I, i i had you know just given up i'm like okay i'm dead done by you know all gone and so to be alive i think i'm just grateful to have a second chance at life again yeah. and uh, i do think that rest of my life is a bonus and yeah. Uh, so yeah so while two big failures and a lot of money spent a lot of time spent because when you are climbing a mountain like everest uh, i think it kind of just becomes a central part of your life in some sense there's no other life you have other than everest so i the only life at least in my case i had was everest i was married but i didn't have like a a, a life there uh, i was living as part of a family but i didn't have a life there i had so many friends no life there no life in anything else i had single relationship on this planet and that relationship was with an inanimate object and a mountain and uh, yeah it, it was it was tough few years that i spent uh, but i never kind of wavered because at the end of the day it was my dream and with a second chance in my hand at life itself it didn't make any sense to give up like yeah. most people who came in 14 and repeatedly came in 15 i think 95 i think more than 95% of them didn't come back in 2016 i think i am one of those rare five group of you know six seven people who came back for the third time in 2016 and um, yeah so came back in 2016 and uh, l- luckily 2016 was a relatively uneventful year and uh, things went through very smoothly at least and i just said relatively uneventful there were many events that happened in 2016 as well but when i compare them to 2014 and 2015 i'm like ah eh, okay sure yeah you know, that was you know too too much of a close call here yeah it was a close call but not that close call so you are like you know always within that relativeness of everything when you talk about safety when you talk about risk but things went like very very smoothly and i remember uh, may 18th uh, about 5 in the evening we were at south coal camp site which is camp 4 which is the last camp on everest and i remember my sherpa mingma tenzi opening the zipper like and i remember his face like you know coming through the zipper like popping and he's like kuntal get ready uh, we are going to leave for the top of the world and then the, the whole team started getting ready and at 7:30 that evening i think one by one everyone started like leaving and me and mingma were left at the end uh, because uh, i was a civilian expedition leader and mingma was the big boss of the team and like we just wanted to make sure everyone is okay and everyone is like good shape and like once they leave both of us would kind of leave so we started walking uh, that night i think it was pretty cold i guess it was about minus 30 celsius but luckily very little wind at least in the beginning 
and then for the next 10 hours we were climbing behind a lot of traffic i think about 250 plus people were trying to climb everest because it turned out to be one of the best weather days of that entire season and uh, i remember getting stuck behind a japanese guy for the first 4 5 hours and feeling very very cold just standing because when you're not moving your body is just not able to circulate enough blood to the extremities and you're just feeling cold 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 all the time if you're moving you are kind of generating that heat by just the by just the action of moving anyway we were able to you know make some really cute tactical decisions at that point a couple of times and we were able to overtake a lot of this traffic and uh, I remember about 9:15 uh, about 12 hours after we left I was standing like 20 steps away from the very top of Mount Everest and uh, I remember Mingma had already reached the top and he was waving to me and he was like like you know come 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 fast and and I think that's the point when I, when it like literally hit me like a missile that man I made it to the top of the world and it was like imagine you have achieved the biggest dream of your life and I was like blown away like i just couldn't cope up with what was going on and i think initially initially i was just relieved i'm like thank god this is done like everest is out of my life i can move on and do other shit and uh, but I, i think after that feeling kind of moved on i was just overwhelmed and i just couldn't stop crying like and i remember you know i was shouting and crying and i like question myself till today what the heck was i doing on the, you know the top like i didn't need to shout i didn't need to do any of those things but you know back at those points you're really not thinking so i was like you know just taking those last final steps and got to mingma and kind of hugged him and said thank you man like like without him this was just not possible like he was definitely the first person like i expressed my gratitude towards and then uh, i kind of you know just took it easy uh, i had a satellite phone Uh, it had 2 dollars of balance and there were two of us on the summit together so both of us had 1 dollar each which meant that i had about 60 seconds to call home and uh, i called home and uh, there was a lot of wind on the top so first i shouted i'm on top of the world and like my wife is like what and i'm like fuck i'm on summit of everest and i'm like i this call is going to get disconnected and can't hear me this is this is not happening from the summit of everest <laughs> like i'm like i need to you know like and you have barely any voice you were just like this you are exhausted you are miserable you are suffering like while you are you like you know joyous beyond belief but you are also suffering beyond belief it's like two extreme emotions at the same time in your body so i'm like i am on top of the world and she's she's like oh awesome man i'm like okay i cut the phone and then of course they knew i was on top of the world so but but of course i had to still get back down i had to still get back down alive because that is super important yeah. uh, and i knew i would because i was very strong um but i think then i just sat and i think I, this view that you see behind is from top of the world is exactly the view that i saw like sitting there and uh, i think it was time to also express gratitude to everest itself uh one that had driven you know 6 years of my life uh and uh, yeah i said thank you to the mountain and then just spent a few minutes and uh, then mingma said let's you know start heading down because there's a fair bit of people who are probably you know start going to start coming like it was me mingma one of our other climbers and his sherpa and then a couple of sherpas from a, a, another team so we were like just six people on the top so it was like relatively no traffic on the top relatively no one on the top in some sense and uh, but there was a huge line of people coming so we knew we knew that at the back of our mind and so we kind of you know started going and then of course over the period of next 2 3 days i was back down and um, all hail and hearty with all my fingers all my toes intact no issues so yeah finally that was kind of the point where i like you know got to the top of everest and finished like what i call the biggest dream of my life yeah wow <laughs> and thanks for sharing it's like very uh, emotional the story especially how you describe it on, on the top <laughs> calling your wife and uh, <laughs> it's amazing um and uh, but but just to uh, clarify like this is uh, this was the first attempt and that's where you don't you don't really consider this a 100% vegan attempt because there was something with the equipment that were you were using which was uh, still from i think it was from a duck 
feathers that was used, a uh, part of the suit. So then you went back to uh, you ended up again on um, Everest uh, two years, two three years later, where you then where you, maybe you could carry on with now going from now you've submitted the top of the world and uh, now you want to are you go on this journey towards making this fully vegan? Like, could you just maybe just briefly explain like? What did you do to make this fully vegan, and uh, why was has it not been done before? Like, are there any um, challenges to making things fully vegan uh, prior to your attempt? Right. So, if I have to, like, you know, list down the top hundred things that were the biggest challenges on my uh, Everest journey, a vegan diet would not even be hundred and first challenge on that list. Yeah. On the contrary, it has not been a challenge at all. Climbing mountains as a on a vegan diet. Now climbing mountains on vegan gear that is a different story. Yes, you can still continue climbing six thousand meter mountains and seven thousand meter mountains wearing vegan gear. One hundred percent vegan gear, very easily. I've done that many times before. Not a problem whatsoever. But climbing an eight thousand meter mountain, which starts requiring you specialized gear. Now that's where a lot of challenges start coming up, especially in two pieces of equipment, which is a one-piece suit that you wear on the top, and then the mittens that you wear on the top. Now the one-piece suit that you wear on the top, of course, it is made from feathers of slaughtered geese, and uh, the mittens that you wear, which protect your fingers and to- uh, fingers mostly, uh, they are either made from the same feathers. Or if they are you made from synthetic material, unfortunately they have a leather uh, covering uh, on the palm. So those were the two main challenges that I kind of faced on that Everest expedition. Mm-hmm. And I, from 2012 2013, as soon as I had a good understanding that I'm going to like sign up very quickly, I started writing to a lot of gear manufacturers across the world, asking them to build animal-free gear for me. Like I wrote, wrote to North Face. I wrote to Mountain Hardware. I wrote to Rab. I wrote to like everyone, anyone, any big company that I knew of. I wrote to them. I said, "Can you make this?" And I think most of the time, answers were not possible, uh, not financially viable. You are the only human in the world demanding for this. Like no one else is demanding for this. Why should we, you know, make it? And those kind of things. So. In some sense, February. Uh, in some sense, 2016 uh, climb was. I think probably the biggest failure of my life. When I just said it was the biggest dream of my life, it was also probably one of the biggest failures of my life. Because I also compromised or I adjusted with my morals and with my ethics around animal rights. And I made that one-time exception that I am going to wear a dead animal on my body. And I'm going to climb to the top of this mountain. While thinking that I am going to prove to the world that vegans can do this. Mm-hmm. And... I think in the hindsight, sure, you know, I think that was a great idea, but I do feel that was a cop out on my part. So with that kind of, you know, when I came back, I knew within within weeks and months, I was already feeling that. And that feeling, you know, kind of never let me, I think I lost my lot of my mental peace in some sense. Yeah. It, it was just hard to kind of like resolve this dilemma that I am a vegan, but I did that. Uh, and sure, you know, I'm I, I'm not a purist in terms of veganism, right? I'm not going to go and check whether the building that I live in, whether the cement is vegan or whether the, the shoes I wear, whether the glue is vegan. So, okay, I'm not that level of a vegan, okay? And, and, and I'm still learning and I'm still growing, but this was an obvious thing. Like the, every photo... Or from the top of the world has me wearing a dead animal on my body. I mean that I'm not a role model for veganism through that photo. I mean that is that was a terrible photo actually in some sense. So I kind of you know that was always at my back of my mind and I kept thinking about it and I said let's just start writing to these companies again. Technology changes, technology improves, veganism is exponentially growing across the world. Now it's no no longer just me. There are so many of us demanding these things. Maybe someone will make it for me. So I kept writing, you know, I kept starting to send back emails and starting to search for companies. And then I wrote to Save the Duck, which is an Italian, uh, a regular jacket manufacturer uh, in some sense. Uh, And I wrote to them on Facebook saying, hey, I want to climb Everest and I would like to use Save the Duck gear on top of Everest. Can you build specialized, customized gear for me? 
and within minutes i was on phone call with the chief marketing officer who thought this was a brilliant idea and that they thought that they had the technology to do this within a days i was talking to the chief designer uh, who you know worked on the insulation part and worked on the technology worked on how the padding would be on those kind of things and for the next 8 to 10 months we were doing a lot of research and development and a lot of back and forth about the design and what i really needed we had the jacket ready finally in april of 2018 and that's when i signed up to climb mount lotse which is the fourth tallest mountain in the world i didn't have the money to climb everest but i did have enough funds for which i took a small loan and i borrowed some money from friends and family and i decided i'm going to climb lotse because the, j- the jacket had to be tested the jacket had only been tested in minus 5 degrees at sea level comparing to minus 40 degrees on the top of everest at you know 33% oxygen that's not a smart choice you know to kind of uh, wear that jacket directly on everest uh, that said it was not a smart choice to wear it on lotse because lotse is just 1000 feet shy of everest but i knew that lotse has lesser drama than everest which means that if things went south at least it will not become a huge issue across the world because vegans are always under this microscope that if something goes wrong <laughs> then like you know yeah. it just become a media clickbait article oh this guy goes on top of everest and dies because he wore a <laughs> vegan jacket so you know that's what will happen uh, and yeah. and i was like really really cognizant of that fact so i said lotse would be a great you know place to go climb and i'm not going to tell anyone so that puts lesser pressure on me i'm going to test this on myself and i think i feel reasonably confident about the jacket and it was pretty fine I summited Lotse on May 15th and uh, I was the first guy to summit uh, on that day and it was perfectly cozy and fine warm and perfect standing on Lotse I can directly see the summit of Everest yeah. like it's like you know straight view it, they are sister mountains so I knew you know I could see Everest and I knew I'm going to stand on top of Everest again very soon and uh, I wrote to save the duck I just didn't have the money that was the last piece that I was missing and say that accept we will like you know sponsor your expedition go climb everest and uh, that's how i came back in 2019 uh, i decided i'll climb from the chinese side because chinese side is slightly colder it's windier it's harsher and more hostile in terms of the environment uh, or in terms of the technical climbing conditions above 8000 meters so i thought imagine if i can go and climb everest in far harsher condition then i can prove beyond a shred of doubt that not only vegan diet works but even vegan care works yeah. because imagine a guy like me with zero genetic predisposition of climbing or bearing cold who lives in mumbai which is plus 40 degrees celsius throughout the year <laughs> if someone like me can wear a save the duck and climb to the top of everest in minus 40 degrees celsius then no human on this planet has an excuse not to do it that fashion yeah. Yeah. or for that matter where an animal ever in their life that was kind of you know my thought process and uh, yeah again the climb was relatively uneventful and uh, may 22nd night we started at again 9:30 in the evening and uh, had a very decent climb no traffic jams luckily uh, i think the only moment probably i was like a little kind of you know dicey was when i got to this point called the second step and this massive 40 feet rock wall in front of me like a 90 degree rock wall and i saw a couple of climbers struggle on that for about 45 minutes and i was standing there cold freezing my ass off and uh, i'm like why am i doing this i just go home why am i you know here suffering you know through all of this and what do i have to prove i have already climbed everest i have already climbed lotse i have already climbed all these mountains i just I, why am i here and i i i think it's sometimes always good to kind of revisit your why and mm-hmm. especially this time around my why was driven by single minded focus there was no everest dream to be completed here everest dream was already done 2016 i already climbed that already proved to myself that i can do it and that was it that was that but this time it was single minded focus of proving to the world that this can be done without eating animals and without wearing animals mm-hmm. in you know in a very very good style can be done and uh, i i think i just said i am just going to walk one step in front of another i'm going to climb this wall let these guys you know go by i mean they struggled for 45 minutes but it took me less than 10 minutes to get to the top of the wall and once i was on top of the wall it was clear that's it i can see the summit of everest now like it's you know less than 2 hours away 
not giving up now so it was just like kind of you know putting your head down one feet in front of another and 5:30 in the morning i was standing on the very top of everest and this time i had only one flag which is the vegan flag the official vegan flag mm-hmm. and like you know i removed it and i was like you know try taking a picture but it was so windy that i never got a shot like you know the picture with vegan flag is completely you know like wavy and everything but i wanted to do it and uh, and i think this was truly speaking in some sense uh end of this you know almost decade long journey mm-hmm. of climbing everest as a vegan because in 2010 i remember when i told everyone that i am going to climb everest as a vegan there was a lot of pushback because yeah. back then no one had even heard of any of this stuff back then veganism was not as exponentially popular as it is today so back then when i wrote to expedition companies they're like what is vegan explain it to us i literally had to like write long emails telling them what i can eat what i cannot eat what i can wear what i cannot wear and when when i would send these emails they would you know write back to me you are mad you, you are not going to climb everest like this without eating beef jerky without eating cheese without eating spam without eating any of these you are not going to get to the top of everest and i'm like i'm going to get on top of everest sure i'm going to get and i was very clear in my mind i'm going to get on the top as a vegan or not do it at all so yeah. in some sense 2019 was like now i'm done now you know this dream is kind of complete and it's time to kind of move forward and do other things or probably you know pursue other passions so that's kind of you know where the journey ended or one journey ended and the next one started yeah then the next you look up and oh there's another mountain waiting for <laughs> us <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's thanks for sharing uh, kuntana and also thanks for like uh, really supporting this vegan movement the way you've done it the fact that your why when you are questioning yourself on this 2019 expedition like the second attempt to uh, to summit mount everest and that becomes okay it's for the vegan movement to get this out there and and prove that is possible with living a vegan lifestyle it just it tells a lot about your commitment to the uh, cause for that to be your why <laughs> for some people that could be just going out of the window when they are <laughs> feeling their ass off in in those heights and they could just go home uh, to, and get comfy again that's that's that tells tells a lot and also for the listener as is exp- like as an example here where you have your why when whenever it gets tough remembering as you mentioned kuntal like really reminding yourself okay why am i doing this whether it's getting fitter getting stronger or being on a weight loss journey or whatever journey you are going on making actually before starting the journey it's a good idea to have like a why exercise think really okay why am i doing this uh, because uh, will if it's a, a, a daring goal that you want to go for something where you really stretch yourself your soul basically to get to achieve it you need to um, you need to figure out what is a why because your mind will want to quit when, whenever things start get pretty hard So um that's that was a an awesome example that you came with was bring up the why uh, in this hard time of climbing and we also uh, we are a bit over time so we we have to round things a bit up so what would be one piece of advice that you would give um we could say it yourself before starting this whole journey but you could also be let's say just meeting someone it's random person who in the world and there's to a listener to to the podcast who's about to start some journey uh, whether it's a fitness health goal or whatever it might be maybe it's going for everest uh, what would be the one piece of advice you would uh, you you would give to to a person who's about to go on a journey where there there will be hardships and challenges on the way so lot of advices but i'm going to kind of stick to one uh, and i'm going to kind of you know give that advice to the 2009 kuntal uh, mm-hmm. and i do think uh, that has been one of the biggest learnings of my last probably 13 12 13 years of you know this journey of fitness and climbing and it has to be around uh, developing lots and lots of patience because uh, there's no instant results or there's no instant gratification in this journey lot of people are chasing results lot of people are on this you know journey uh, where when i'm going to get to the top of everest when's this going to happen and my thing to them always is stop chasing the results stop chasing that you know top of the world moment that's going to happen don't get me wrong that is very important 
that's going to happen but fall in love with the process yeah fall in love with showing up every single day with a sense of purpose and you know going through that day uh and that's you know pretty much you know the advice that i would give that kuntal because that kuntal took a lot of time to develop that amount of patience and i don't think that kuntal would probably even understand uh, patience a lot uh in 2009 um uh, but i do do think that people unnecessarily expect too many instant results yeah. uh all the time maybe they going on a fitness journey like i started my bodybuilding journey about 10 months ago i am not sitting here and thinking i am going to stand on stage you know in in my year two i am here sitting and thinking probably you know if i have you know done good enough consistency and discipline for the next 10 years probably i will be in good shape to maybe you know do a decent competition maybe after 10 years so i'm thinking decades there is most people when they get on get into journeys they are always thinking days i'm like yeah. nothing happens in days nothing so that's what i would kind of say fall in love with the process and have patience if you are kind of you know uh, on the right path and if you are putting in a lot of effort uh, you are going to get results but yeah. you have to kind of stay on track and and be patient yeah yeah it, it's a great like one of the best advice you can give someone like process over results definitely because the results they always come out of, uh, as an outcome uh, of proper steps that have been taken then they become the fruit of the steps in the work so uh, and sometimes also just if you only focus on the result then you you ignore all the steps you need to be taking right now and really putting in quality process work that will get you faster and more in a more efficient safer way to the goal um, rather than just daydreaming about i want to be on top of that mountain <laughs> one day so uh, yeah but, uh, great great advice um, and um, so what's next for you so um, is there a, a new everest attempt or is it totally different mountain you are about you will be conquering Maybe, I'm not saying it is mountain, but it could be some other field you want to go for. Like, what's next uh, for Kuntal Joshua? So it's definitely combining the worlds of bodybuilding and big mountain climbing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it has been done before ever. So, kind of, you know, my aspiration is at some point in future, I want to stand on stage and compete in a drug-free bodybuilding competition, like super jacked and super ripped. down to you know like maybe 5 6% body fat which is something i don't think any human in my community has ever even dreamt most of them are 35 plus percent body fat percentage so to kind of do that and then stand down from the stage and within weeks go and climb to the top of mount everest so that you know okay. is something that i would like to uh, whatever i've read whatever I, whoever i've spoken to till now has said not possible those two journeys don't have a lot of common ground uh and sure you know i understand at a mechanistic level and at a lot of uh, science level why they are saying that but look i'm willing to make myself that n equal to 1 experiment and go on this journey and then find out oh it's not possible or maybe i'm willing to you know change my goal post but until you know i have gone on that journey and found that out i'm not stopping so that's the new journey i am on and i'm laying that foundation work that i mentioned earlier that you have to you know set that foundation of maybe physical fitness skills and experience similarly for this journey is going to require different amount of foundation work so i'm starting to work on that and lay that out and so yeah i'm probably a decade maybe more i don't know or maybe maybe earlier than that i have no clue when it's going to happen for now as you said and as you know uh, we discussed process over results so right yeah. now i'm very process focused and i'm just you know going through yeah yeah well then i uh, wish you good luck with it and if people want to follow you uh, follow this journey that you're now going on um uh, like where 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 do you want where should people uh, go to if they want to know know more about you and follow you best place to uh, reach out to me or follow my journey would be on instagram uh, my handle is @kuntalj mm-hmm. that would be the best place Okay, 
great. Super. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, uh, Quintal. Again, I would I would love to talk even more, but we have to respect the time. So uh, yeah, I I, I just want to thank you for being uh, willing to be on the My Being a Personal Trainer podcast, and maybe we can get you on another time and discuss other details with uh, Everest or what you are about to start in, in with your current journey. So uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, glad to be here and thank you for the invite. Yes, <laughs> take care. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kuntal Joshua. Mentioned links will be found in the show notes. Thanks for listening and make sure to subscribe to the show. Our next episode is going to be in alignment with our slogan, change your mindset, change your life. Ever since this project has been running since back in 2014, I've been having this slogan very early on but never really made any content that directly works on changing your mindset so be prepared for some highly valuable tools that you will be able to use in all walks of life i've been using those tools in my own life ever since i got introduced to them and also been starting to present those same tools to my clients and the the results in general are uh, are amazing i've been getting a lot of great response so uh, it's very likely that you might also find something very useful about those tools if you've been enjoying the show so far do consider leaving a re- rating and review as this will help us get out to more people like yourself who can benefit from the content that we are producing via this podcast Anyway, that was it for now. Change your mind and change your life. See you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the My Vegan Personal Trainer Podcast with Ramey at www.myveganpersonaltrainer.com.